My name is Eric Theiss. I'm here from San Francisco, and I have the privilege of giving the talk that's most unlike the others, I think, probably, for this conference. Um, this will be probably more art history than open street map, but, um, you know, this, I'm going to talk about an interesting tradition, and I think the tradition has some possibilities that it can bring to bear on cartography, particularly cartography that's generated from open data that we have access to and can change as we need. So let me start. Yeah, and thanks for coming. So um, talk's called Lessons Learned from Experimental Film. Um, some people said, yeah, but what is it really? And I, I guess the kind of my working principle for this stuff I'm doing is that uh, I'm trying to imagine that if you could pluck a handful of filmmakers from the 70s and bring them here and take their cameras away and give them leaflet and post gis and tile mill and tell them to make something, what would they make instead of films? So um, I have some directions for that. Uh, why am I interested in this stuff? Well, I mean, I, I come from a traditional, I guess, background for this kind of work that we do here. Um, you know, I had a business undergraduate and engineering graduate work. Um, but I was always kind of interested in cartoons and animation as a kid. Um, while I was in grad school, this large festival of experimental animation came to Chicago and ran for two weeks at the Art Institute. And I went once to check it out, and I ended up going every day. And it was kind of this mind-blowing experience. I can still see a lot of those films in my head, even though it was a long, long time ago. So that got me very interested in those films. And of course, when the festival left, it was like, all right, where can I continue to see this work? And really, the only place that we show anything like this were some of the experimental film venues in Chicago at the time, such as Chicago Filmmakers. So eventually, I got involved with film beyond animation, just experimental film in general. Went on to curate some programs in Chicago and also in San Francisco when I moved there. Um, did some writing about Warhol's films that actually allowed them to reconstruct one of his more notorious films in the 90s. Um, and have a little bit of cred, I made, when we're talking about experimental films, I made a film without a camera using etchings I made from corn husks. So that's an experimental film. So, <laughs> Um, and I filmed it, you know, like in the world of experimental film, it did really well. It showed it like 30 galleries and a few thousand people saw it. And I made no money at all, except from Canada. Canada paid me a rental for a festival, so that was cool. Um, the way I think about film and animation and maps is that they both have these sort of systems that have evolved for making marks that convey information across a two-dimensional space and in time. So films play for you, interactive things. You work through um, a map you unfold and look at or you work at on a screen. Um, and so in a certain way, there's mark making in both of these systems. And it's kind of interesting to think, OK, what do they have in common? Or how, can they, how are they different? Um, I gave you a trajectory of me. I'm going to give you a really brief trajectory of American experimental film, because most of this is not relevant. Um, if you find this work interesting, want to know more about it, probably the most classic book on it is Visionary Film by P. Adam Sidney. Um, and he kind of says, well, film went through these various phases. Early American experimental film was a surrealist, like the Europeans. Um, but then it moved into sort of a lyrical and mythopoetic uh, situation. And then with the Cold War, it became apocalyptic, but also picaresque in the sense of adventures and innocence, more innocence. And then film kind of came into its own as a medium, and people started making what are known as structural films, which is what I'm going to talk mostly about today. But if you've seen any experimental films, chances are good that you've seen uh, Maya Darren's Meshes of the Afternoon. It's an experimental film. Um, there's this hooded figure that appears throughout the film. And at one point, the figure turns and has no face but has a mirror, which is really still shocking today, kind of, the first time you see it. This film's from the 40s. Um, you know, thousands of students have remade this film now, so it's lost a little bit of its thing. But um, it's quite a beautiful film. It's on a lot of collections. And people show it as a short at theater, so you may have seen that film. Um, Stan Brackage, a legendary American experimental filmmaker, made hundreds of films, really exemplifies the sort of struggle, internal struggle, poetic struggle, abstract expressionist, I'm making art here kind of work, very beautiful work. Um, you know, a lot of um, experimental film came of age as, as these things became cheaper. Um, people were working during the Cold War and fear of atomic, uh, atomic bombs. So some of this work reflects that. Bruce Connors' work is infatuated with it. Um, but there are also kind of playful 60s romps, such as Robert Nelson's Great Blondino, which is about a, a, a historically true character that crossed Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow. Um, but he takes great liberties and makes his own story with that. And then there's structural filmmaking, um, which I'll mention in detail 
just because it's this thing that is kind of the end of American experimental film as a, as a recognizable um, new genre. Um, the still here is from another film that you might have seen if you've seen an experimental film. This is a film called Wavelength by the Canadian artist Michael Snow. Um, basically it's a 30-40 minute film where the camera is set up on a tripod on one end of this artist's loft and over time it just slowly zooms to the far wall on the other side where there are some photographs and it comes to rest on a photograph of the ocean. So the whole journey of the film is through a three-dimensional space, which then gets sort of flattened out into a photograph, but then also opens up into an ocean. Um, there, are, there is some drama that happens in the space. Um, people come in, move furniture, or somebody dies off screen. Um, there's conversations, the phone rings. But mostly it's about this kind of navigation through space. Not even navigation, just traversal across space. Um, and these are things that, that characterize that kind of experimental filmmaking. Um, I like this picture, it's Warhol. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but this is at a place called the Invisible Cinema, which was in New York. Um, they were very serious about viewing films, so they actually put baffles on the seat so you couldn't actually turn and talk to your date. <laughs> they had holes so you could hold hands, but you couldn't actually talk. <laughs> Focus, you gotta be focused. The Invisible Cinema. Okay, and then this. This is not a film I'm going to show, but it is actually a warning I'm going to give. This is from a film called The Flicker by Tony Conrad, who's also known as a musician. Based out of Buffalo, um, this is from his film The Flicker, which is a series of only black and white frames that start off sort of gently pulsating and then become quite violently strobing as the film goes on. Um, the film can trigger epileptic seizures, and I don't think anything I'm going to do is going to do that today. But um, I did give a version of this talk at NASIS last fall, and there was one man who was very mad at me for not warning him that he was going to get motion sickness from some of the stuff I saw. So if you are sensitive to things flashing and strobing, um, please look away from the screen. I don't know what else to say. Um, I guess you'll get your money's worth. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about a film called um, Stream Velocity by Ernie Gere. Ernie Gere's still alive, working out of Brooklyn, having a lot of success late in his career. Um, and he basically made this film, Stream Velocity, which involved setting up a camera in a hallway, institutional hallway, um, and he zoomed forward, shooting a single frame, zoomed backwards, shot single frames, and so on. So there was this simple oscillation in this hallway um, that he then grew. So the jumping became larger and then later on it became larger. By the end of the film, it's basically the end of the hallway and this end of the hallway. So there's quite a lot of back and forth. And it sounds boring and some people, plenty of people walk out on this film. Um, but what's interesting to me about the film is that it's, um, at the short distances, it does read like a moving through space, a forward and backwards, but as the film progresses, um, this very deep space suddenly becomes sort of shallow and you're really just kind of bouncing around this 2D colored pattern. So I'm going to show a little bit of this. It's not a very good reproduction. It's from UvuWeb. Um, actually, let me see if I'm at the beginning or not. I guess I am. Yeah. So this is kind of how it goes. Um, it's a 23 minute film. <laughs> it's an experimental film. Um, but again, you can see this is sort of shallow, bouncing, and then I'll skip forward a little bit. It um, becomes a little bit more severe. And more severe. And so on. So the, the sort of large X of the shadows kind of focus you and suggest depth, but you know, after you've endured this film for a while, it really becomes more about an animation between the white panels on the, the light panels on the wall, the fluorescence, the coming and going of the exit signs, there's ashtrays and other things in the hallway, and it, it kind of obliterates the depth that it sets you up to begin with. Um, and the last thing I'll mention about the film, which is that it does have a little bit of drama, but he filmed this overnight. At the very end of the hallway there are windows, so there does start to be daylight coming at the end of the film. Um, I show this because this seemed like a really easy thing to do in mapping. Um, seemed like a nice place to start. I, I set this project uh, up for myself as a way to learn more detail about tools that um, I use day to day for more conventional things, but I wanted to get into the guts of the leaflets and the tile mills and these kinds of things and use them for things that they weren't necessarily intended to, to be used for. So, um, let's see Serene Velocity as a map. 
hopefully this will hang on a second. Let me um, <clears throat> restart this. Well, I don't know why it does this sometimes. Hang on a second. I guess it's working. So, I mean, it's pretty much a direct reproduction of the film as close as that can be done, given that the zoom level changes and it's a proxy for the shifting of the zoom lens. Um, and it is the kind of thing that if you see it in a dark space and you let it play for longer, this is, a, this is not a 23 minute version, of course. Um, a lot of the same things happen. This is uh, probably obvious as DC. Um, I chose DC partly because the conference is here, but also because it does have this diagonal network of roads that kind of are um, sympathetic to the depth in the, um, in the hallway in the original film. So. Um, that was an example, and I have, I have yet to show this to filmmaker friends, but um, this is done, and I'm going to put that up on the web and let people know. So there are, there are still discussion groups about experimental film. So I'll be kind of curious what people say, if they think this is just a dumb joke or if this is actually of interest. I think it's kind of of interest, but anyway, so that's the first one. I'll take a question if you have any questions. Well, let me maybe do them at the end. Let's do them at the end. Because you're probably going to say, why are you doing this again? Mark, Rob, Rob. This is another filmmaker, Peter Rose. And your zelta dem de ubragen parta tins pror in tifardo cor jung de pistra tardo conge pistra carge bing da tucte fordo conge ipcas ranging ca forte purda sande ficistro col jartung de parte a kinge den and zen Part of what I like about this film, so this film is all subtitles. Um, subtitles to an invented, a series of invented languages. So there's no images ever in this film, it's just subtitles. Um, he's, a, he's a filmmaker who's very interested in language, also has, has been a performance artist in his time. Um, what I like, I, I, don't know if you could, I don't know if you can see the titles, they're not super clear even to me up here. Um, but there's, there's a lot of humor in the piece, in that particular one that he's going on and on, and the, cat, and the subtitle just says, The Interminable Winter. So <laughs> he's kind of doing The Interminable Winter uh, for quite a while. Um, as the film progresses, the, um, there's a breakdown in the communication, and so... Um, Here you see first grade. Sorry, the film, um, the subtitles become... <laughs> Increasingly strange. So you get the idea. Um, what? I'll turn the sound down on this because it's mostly grunts and random noises at this point. Um, but what I like about this film and what I think it has to do with maps is that it brings a sense of humor and also a sense of um, awareness to what the convention, in this case, what are, what are the conventions of film? What are the conventions of subtitles? How do we work with those things? And what do we, what's the humor built into a film that has subtitles but no actual visuals? So. Um, I'm interested in bringing this kind of overlay of information to map bubbles. So when you hover over a space, perhaps early on in your interaction with the map, you'll get information about what a particular thing is, and you know, standard kind of information encoded in GeoJSON. But I think as time um, plays out with your interaction with the map, the 
texts will also start to break down in the same way. Letters will drop out, things will translate, things will come back as Pig Latin, things will come back in other ways. So again, it's a way of kind of frust frustrating your experience of using a map or perhaps showing you that a map is you know, not as uh, innocent or dry or objective as it could be. So this is a project I'm working on with this and it'll be, it's, it's, um, it's not really ready to show now, but um, this is what I'm working on now is working with texts, um, some APIs like WordNick and these kinds of things to, to complicate text with maps. I want to show you a couple other filmmakers and then I'll, I'll clear the stage. Um, this is a filmmaker named Robert Breer. Breer was a painter, also an animator. Um, one of the things he was very interested in was how much information can you present um, frame by frame. Film typically goes 24 frames per second, so if every frame in a film is different, what does that mean? Can we pick that up? Can we make sense of it? Um, and so, this is something I'm interested in looking at from a background layer, from a tile layer, actually using animated GIFs and so on, either plucked from video or created in other ways to um, swap out what's normally in a base layer and show things like this. Um, a friend has asked me, you know, is what is what are you doing this for? And I think in some cases it's really about experiments with perception to see what you can take and what you can um, make sense of or what sense you bring of it in the bring to it in light of it not making sense. But I also think things like this can actually patch together or collage together sort of narratives. So if somebody working with the tools I'm creating wants to create an actual story or a feeling or collage, um, it would be possible to do it with technique like this. And then I will end with one more filmmaker who um, is also, Robert Brew passed away a few years back. Um, Paul Glebicki is a, yeah, let me shut this off for a second, is a Pittsburgh-based based artist who actually just had a show in New York a couple months ago, so he's still alive and productive and working. Um, Glubicki, for me, the most interesting thing Glubicki does and the thing I want to take out of his work and apply to my own is that he um, is very good at creating illusions. He'll show you something that's very solid, very three-dimensional, present it to you, and then some event will let it just fall apart. So all the lines will just pivot and slide down the screen, or explode, or so on. Um, so again, there's this notion of solidity that then becomes solidity and also three-dimensionality that um, is easily exploded and turned into 2D just line segments. So I'm interested, especially as the ability to process vectors get faster, to do these kind of things to road networks and other other objects that we display in our map plane. So let me just show you a couple of excerpts from Paul Glebicki's films. These are, these are from four films, I think. Shoot. Space, space bars to video players and space bars to reveal are not the same command. So this sort of sliding down the screen or otherwise dissolving something that's solid is, is what I think is interesting. These are, this is an excerpt from his best, probably best known film called Film White Film. And he constructs this chair, which I think you can see, I hope you can see. Torna subito. And then just lets it fall and drop. So my interest is in getting into an overlay of vectors and then manipulating them in such a way that the same sort of deconstruction can happen. Mm -hmm. I'll show you a couple more. There's, there's a color film where the same thing happens to this grand piano. It just kind of dissolves. Maybe a foreign language. Well, I should say, I mean, I, I'm old. 
when people made these things, this is part of like he drew all this by hand. This was all done on a sharp with a sharpie on typing paper. Right. Like it looks computer generated, but this was he swore not to do that at the time, and I don't think it was easy to do that at the time either. So this is part of the stuff is all just drawn. Hey, I'm out of time. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll just close by saying if you live somewhere where these kinds of films are shown, why not go see some? Um, and again, my goal in looking at this stuff and talking about this stuff is to bring in some of these ideas to cartography. Not necessarily that it'll help us make more informative maps, but it might help us make more interesting and artistic and aesthetically and perceptually challenging maps. Um, I'm not sure who mod I think I have time for questions. So if you have any questions, please shoot. Otherwise, I'll clear the stage. Hey. What was the first part? Oh. The question was, do I feel constrained by the tools? And um, I don't. I feel, I feel more constrained by my time and my abilities. <laughs> um, you know, in the case of Leaflet, uh, you know, getting in there and just seeing how easy it is to extend it, it's like, I want to do this. Here's where it happens. This is how I extend it. You know, it's it's a lovely thing to work with. Um, I find that I'm pushing I'm pushing my knowledge of tile mill. Um, so I may have some questions for the Mapbox folks <laughs> now that this talk is over, and I'm convinced myself that I don't know how to do some of these things. I do have some questions. So uh, I I wish I were at the point where I felt constrained. Um, some of the, you know I think everything I want to do can be done by extending you know, in the object-oriented sense, um, the tools that I have because they're open source. Again, the, the tools are open source so I can do what I need and the data is changeable in any way I need. So I don't feel constrained by anything but my own lack of time and some abilities. Yeah? Have you tried applying narrative filmmaking to this concept? Have I tried applying narrative filmmaking to this concept? Um, well, I, I haven't. Um, I tend to, in, in my artistic life, I tend to always like go right to the margins. You know, like so, my musical tastes are at the margins, and my cinema tastes are also at the margins. I do think, um, and my my goal is to build things that I like, and then I will open source them and let people use them. And I do think people could use them for that. And I think in the, as I mentioned, I think in the the Breer type stuff where the, the collaging can happen. I think definitely over time there's an accumulation, and if you direct that then there's a narrative. You know, it's definitely not a direct narrative, but there is this association that builds. Um, I'm not opposed to telling stories. I find, I mean, I, I rarely go to blockbuster films and so on because it's, it's too easy. Does that answer your question? Or do you have any suggestions or thoughts on that? No, it's just something I'm curious about. OK. I mean, I, I imagine that there will be things that come out of this that are just sort of effects. and. You know, one of the histories of experimental film is that like people did all these cool things for art's sake, and they all got pulled into rock videos and TV commercials and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, a lot of these things don't look experimental anymore, but at the time they were quite shocking, and yet they've become part of the language. And um, I'm sure we see things much more quickly than Breer could have imagined we'd see in 1952 or whatever when he was making that film, because we just have um, polished that sense. Yeah, hi. So I found out you know, yesterday from the lightning talks about map story. Uh, I think this would be really cool to do with temporal rendering, and you have all this data that's you know, rendering over time. Have you thought about doing anything in combination like that to kind of tell the story? I've thought about it. I haven't really looked at it yet. That's kind of early for that. Again, my, you know, really my, my, my interest, a lot of it is, I'm going to talk about Paul Schertz because I, I want to, I could probably talk a whole session about him, but he, you know, he's very much about color strobing and after image, and these things interest me a lot. It's like, you know, if I slam you with a blue and an orange, then what are you going to see? Even if there's nothing on the screen, what do you, what do you see? Like, what, what exhausts your system and what's your reaction to that system? That, that kind of interests me more, not because I don't like you or I want to, like, wear you out, but that, that's more interesting to me than telling a story, but, you know, I'm happy to collaborate with people and stories are good. Yep. Have you ever looked at OpenStreetMap as a medium as opposed to like maps as a medium? So in the sense that OpenStreetMap is like this thing that you have to kind of understand in a way like 
film is the thing you have to understand in your ways of researching experimental filmmaking is to like, like you not use the camera. So I'm just curious, like, to what extent open screen map is part of what you think about when you make art? I think there will be times when I will not find naturally occurring features that do what I need to do, and so I'll have to invent landscapes. I mean, I'm not going to contribute those back, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I imagine that, you know, that I mean, I am comfortable with the database, or I'm getting comfortable with the database structure and how things are tagged and so on. So I kind of know where to do that, so it would work with what I have. So in that way, I see it. I mean, I'm not, you know, there are artists who are pranksters and want to, like, you know, deturn things. I'm not interested in deterring OpenStreetMap. I have too many friends. You know? <laughs> um, but I, I do, yeah, I, I do see it. As, I mean, I see the tools as my medium more now, but I do, th I do see it as a medium, yeah. Anybody else? I should probably clear out, right? Who's next? Nobody's next. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm going to get off the stage. So, anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>